Hello everyone and welcome to the second night of Pint and Science from the University of Southampton. I'm John Coxon, your host, and I'm going to be taking you through the world of science and also the world of pints. And today I am drinking Secret Treaties, which is a collaboration by Unity and Make Make. Uh, so what you're drinking, please post it in the comments. The coolest and weirdest ones we will read out doesn't have to be beer, anything at all, including knowledge, as we found out yesterday. Uh, do keep the comments coming on YouTube, but also please feel free to tweet. The hashtag is Pint21 and the at is Pint of Science. I've been tweeting earlier today. I'm very excited. I'm very excitable. And uh, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. So get your comments in early so we can discuss them with the speakers at the end. First up today, we have David Sear. Uh, David is a professor, professor of physical geography at the University of Southampton, and he's a fascination with sediments and what they can tell us about our past. And he's going to be talking to us tonight about mud models and the migration into the Pacific. Thank you very much and take it away, David. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, John. Thank you to those who are listening. Um, I didn't realise it was product placement time, but I'm drinking Adnan's Broadside from the Suffolk coast, which is where I'm from originally. Um, so look, I'm too many people to thank, but the uh, science I'm going to show you is a, a, a cumulative effort of a bunch of people, uh, not least the three standing on a raft in the middle of a very remote volcanic crater lake in Samoa. What took us there? Well, uh, we're really interested in the story of the journey of humans across the world. And the most amazing part of that, arguably, is, is one of the last great journeys. And that was the one into the vast Pacific Ocean. And I love this image of the planet taken with a view from the Pacific. Uh, it is all blue. And there you can see three islands that I'll say a little bit more about um, that represent a fraction of the thousands of islands that span that Pacific Ocean. Uh, those islands have a, a wonderful uh, people, uh, the Polynesians, uh, the Melanesians, the Pacifica people, as they call themselves. And they uh, managed to colonize and occupy the Pacific Islands. We can see here that that journey took a little while. And there were some really interesting parts to it as well. Um, they came uh, from uh, Taiwan, Philippine area and moved through into the Solomon Islands that uh, uh, Willie is going to talk to us about a little bit later and then through into Fiji and Samoa, arriving there about 3,000 years uh, before present. And then they had a long pause. There was a pause of around about 1,500 years before they then very rapidly progressed east into uh, remote Polynesia, colonizing the Cook Islands, the Society Islands, and then eventually Hawaii, New Zealand, Easter Island. And as this wonderful uh, uh, diagram uh, from Atisu Smith um, shows that uh, possibility that they did voyaging that took them to the Americas. However, there are various ideas as to how they did it um, and also as to why they did it. And I think what I want to uh, put to you tonight is that actually climate was really, really important for that last great migration. They did it in voyaging canoes, and those canoes need wind in the right direction and the right sort of conditions to enable them to move east across that vast ocean. And it really is fast. If you look at the um, picture that you can see now, there are two great climate systems, the South Pacific Convergence Zone, SPCZ. It's huge. It's the southern hemisphere's greatest convective rainstorm um, uh, feature. And that is what gives these Pacific Islanders their water. Um, and without it, uh, you get droughts and you get um, real problems. Uh, it's also important for their food security. And the thing we can see in the bottom left in the moving image there is the uh, movement of the rainfall. Pink is high intensity rainfall for the ITCZ and the SPCZ. Um, they move around and when they move around, different islands become dry or wet. So the questions then, how did they get there? Why did they make those great voyages? And to understand that, first question up is, could the canoes make the long journeys? Now, we don't have any real uh, uh, 
complete records of a Polynesian voyaging canoe. But we do have early records um, and some um, fragments of archaeology of these boats. And so what we did was ask that question, could they actually sail these distances from Samoa to the Cook Islands, for example? So what we did, we took the information we had, we made models, both physical, and you can see one in the wind tunnel here at the University of Southampton, uh, where I worked with um, ship scientists. And we looked at the performance of these uh, hulls and different sailing types. And we tried to work out what conditions favored the voyaging and could they make it? Now, some people have argued for a technological barrier. Um, you know, was it the canoe design that stopped them? Well, actually, we know that they were voyaging around the islands before they got to that period of a long pause from Samoa to the Cook Islands. So they could sail hundreds of kilometers at sea. But what we found out through our analysis here, uh, and much of this work is Tom Dixon, a PhD student, was that actually to get the right wind direction um, which enabled these uh, canoes to actually make the voyages across that jump from Samoa to the Cook Islands and, and onwards, the conditions were most favorable during El Nino's. That's when successful voyages were most likely to happen. So the canoes could make it and that's great, but only when specific wind conditions characteristic of strong El Nino's uh, allowed that journey to happen. Now, the interesting thing about strong El Nino in the Pacific is that they are also associated with very dry conditions in Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu. And so the question we then had was, could that be the motivation for voyaging? Now, to find out the climate a thousand years ago or more, uh, we don't have any records not official sort of monitored records. In fact, the rainfall records of the Pacific Islands only go back about 50 to maybe 100 years at best. But what we do have are lake sediment records. Now, lakes are great because loads of stuff washes into lakes. Um, pollen, diatoms grow in there. Some volcanic eruptions leave tephra. Um, all sorts of wonderful things go into those lakes. So what you can do is you can get a core of mud up from the bottom of these lakes uh, you can then analyze it. And some of these things contain information that tell you about the climate itself. And we were able to um, do that, which involved taking small rubber boats halfway across the world um, and up a mountain through the jungle, uh, assemble it and take the mud and then bring it all the way back to the UK. And we did that in a bunch of islands. These islands were Vanuatu, you can see here, uh, with Lake Emawatul. Uh, Samoa and the island of Upalu, you can see the lake there, Lanato'o is a beautiful crater lake right at the highest point. And then in the Cook Islands, Lake Teroto. We took the mud and we tried to find climate proxies, as they call it. Now, one of the best and simplest climate proxies is the mud that's washed in during heavy rain. You can see here um, a, a photo I took out of the window of a plane passing over one of our la lakes in a rainstorm. And you can see the mud in the water there, turning the um, lake the color of the soil. And the red uh, uh, graph you can see to the left there is a measure of the amount of that soil in the lake sediments. And it's very simple. More of it is basically wetter conditions. When it rains, the soil is eroded and washed into the lake. When it's dry, less of it ha uh, is washed in. The blue line is an independent, uh, what's called a biomarker, a molecular fossil. And that's also showing that round about a thousand years ago, um, 1000 AD here, you had a dry period prior to the arrival of humans on that island. When we look at similar records from Samoa, the top graph there, uh, and again, the Southern Cook Island graph, what we see is that there was a prolonged drought the, the longest, largest drought, if you like, uh, in the last 2000 years. And it coincided with the period of migration from Samoa um, and probably Tonga into uh, the East Pacific. And so our basic uh, idea is that the prolonged drought of 900 to 1100 AD in these islands of Samoa and Tonga, um, after a thousand or more years of population growth on those islands 
he probably had pressure in that uh, period of drought that caused people to make decisions to take risky voyages. The favorable easterly winds and the canoe technology at the time during that period uh, enabled them to uh, make survivable voyages east. Interestingly enough, if you look at the uh, remaining part of the graph, we see that very quickly the rains return, it gets wetter in those islands and it gets wetter right across uh, the Pacific. So that after AD 1150, uh, conditions were favorable for settlement and establishment of uh, uh, people on those islands in East Polynesia. So our argument is that climate was a key factor in the migration of people into the Pacific. Now, wind the clock forward to the current day and indeed into the future. And in the 21st century, we see climate driven pressures now on these Pacific Islanders. And Willie's going to say a lot more about that um, from a real experience later. Historically, then, voyaging to new lands was part of their adaptation strategy to climate change. But of course, today, there are no new lands. They're already occupied. They've been converted into nations and people own the land. And so now uh, the adaptation strategy to migrate is no longer uh, as simple as it was or indeed uh, arguably feasible. That means looking to the future, solutions are going to have to now lie in negotiating available space for these climate refugees. And what's fascinating, of course, is that that's going to happen in the well, it's happening now and it's going to happen uh, increasingly over the next few decades. So these are going to be uh, Pacific Island communities that grew up in one type of island, maybe having to move to quite different places. And there are all sorts of interesting questions to ask about that. So I hope that's been a, a, an interesting introduction to the Pacific. Lots of thanks for people, lots of people to thank in terms of funders. And there's a great Pacific Islander, a voyager who voyaged in some of the recent reconstructed canoes, dear old Coro, um, who sadly passed away, but was a great help to us. So thanks, John. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much to David. Um, and please, I've noticed a couple of questions in the chat for David already. And we'll be going through those in the Q&A later, but please keep those questions coming in. Um, and I like your shirt, David. I just want to say that before I let you uh, sign off. That is uh, fantastic. But I dress the part. Um, so I've noticed one comment in the chat from Bella Linzel, who tells us that she is rather far from a canoe, but is very close to a liquid sea of aspals. So that's good to know. I'm only drinking one pint. I'm not drinking a sea, but then I am on duty. So that might be why. Um, uh, keep your comments coming in and keep what you're drinking and questions for the speakers coming in and I'll be reading them out in between the talks. Um, next up, we have Charlotte Hipkiss. Uh, Charlotte is a PhD student at the University of Southampton and her research focuses on environmental change and drought in tropical South Pacific islands. And she's going to talk to us today about the make and break of island life. So take it away, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for having me as well. It's uh, great. Really happy to share some of uh, what I've been doing with everyone. So like he says, I'm going to be talking a bit about the make and break of island life and just kind of the key to the success of human settlement of the Pacific Islands. So looking a bit more at kind of the archaeology kind of fits into the story that David's been telling you about the Pacific so far. So, you know, you've seen this image already. David's kind of covered this. But, you know, just to recap, the sort of migration of humans across the Pacific, but, you know, kind of represents the final frontier of human colonization on Earth. And we had these two waves. You have the first wave 3,000 years ago, and then after a sort of a very long pause, the second wave into eastern Polynesia, um, going, you know, this beach in the sort of pinnacles of the triangle, the Hawaii, the northeast of Ireland and New Zealand, just as David said. Um, but, you know, colonizing and settling on these remote um, sort of oceanic islands is a high risk strategy. Humans navigated like vast distances, sometimes thousands of kilometers of empty ocean uh, to start, settle on these like tiny pockets of land, with limited resources, sometimes not even knowing what they would even find. Um, so, you know, David talked to you about why and how people migrated across the Pacific. And my talk, I guess, kind of 
uh, fills in the gaps almost. It talks about the kind of intervening period, you know, what happened once people arrived on the islands, how are they able to colonize this vast and challenging region? Because, you know, there's no denying, like Pacific Islanders were, you know, they were wildly successful at colonizing by around sort of 1300 AD, nearly most, like every island in the tropical Pacific had been colonized by people and they continued to live there for thousands of years. And this is despite, you know, this ever-changing climate that David was talking about, limited resources and finite space. And if we kind of look at the sort of archaeological history of the Pacific, it's clear there's kind of a typical cycle to island life. So, and we see the cycle occur sort of again and again as people, you know, migrate across the Pacific eastwards. And it kind of starts with, I'm just going through this really quickly, kind of step one, arrival. This is simply what David has been talking about, something potentially climate motivated people to move and the technology their canoes allowed them to do so. And they set sail and they arrived at a new island leading on to step two, colonization. So at this stage, uh, islanders primarily depended upon the natural resources of the island for sort of their food and water resources. You know, fishing was a really important uh, food source, hunting of wild bird populations, things like that. And then leading on from this, as populations grew, they get the kind of establishment um, at this point, you know, wild resources are becoming depleted as the population grows, the supply is kind of outweighing the demand. And at this point, they start to move inland and develop sort of agriculture because they didn't come empty handed. They brought with them crops they knew they'd be able to grow, um, you know, as they needed them. And, during, you know, we see kind of similar parallels even in British history, this kind of shift from hunter gatherer to farming. Um, but, you know, the Pacific Islanders, the Pacific people have, I guess they have one up on us that, you know, traversing huge areas of ocean to be able to do this. And then this kind of leads us to step four is, you know, the population continues to develop and grow. We see the development of um, complex social hierarchies, the rise of the chiefdoms. And we see this occur all across the Pacific, so in Fiji and the Cook Islands in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, I've got, the, you have to forgive me this little cartoon that I've made, but these little people kind of hanging on, you know, maybe as populations grow, resources become scarce, or maybe as environments conditions become challenging as David's been talking about then you know they've essentially decided to move on as an adaptation strategy you know however you know there are a few exceptions to this story most islands were continuously colonized but we have these we call them mystery islands of the pacific this is based on work done by uh, Athel Anderson in the early 2000s and he looked at these mystery islands which are kind of in the subtropicals so they're further south of the kind of most of the tropical pacific islands and they've sort of there's some interesting stories. So we've got these kind of color coded them here for you. So we've got some in green, um, and these are islands that we know were colonized in this area, and this sort of further south as they were spreading out through the Polynesian Triangle. They were colonized by people and were continuously inhabited by humans uh, throughout history. And then in this group, we have sort of the famous Easter Island. And um, in the sort of bottom left here, we've got Lord Howe Island, which is in orange because this is a bit of an anomaly. Um, people, as far as we know, people never arrived on this island and um, never lived there. And in red, we've got um, islands that were colonized, but at some point, for some reason, they were abandoned by people. They were left behind. And in this sort of the west here, we've got Norfolk and Raoul Island, which is close to New sort of north of New Zealand. And in the east, we've got Pitcairn and Henderson Island, which kind of sit between French Polynesia and Easter Island. And the you know, question that we have is, you know, Pacific Islanders were generally really successful, but why, in certain cases, we would know what were the breaks? What were the things that meant that these islands weren't able to be colonized and continuously inhabited by human beings? You know, what was the key to success? So the first factor and kind of consider is location. Location, location is really important because in the first stage of colonization, that little cartoon that I um, sort of laid out for you, we have the sort of um, sort of first colonization. The really you know wild resources uh, are really important. We see um, evidence that you know fishing in particular was important, but also wild bird populations. We see people eating uh, tortoises seals in the subtropical islands and my favorite is in Vanuatu there's evidence that the land crocodile went extinct because it was being hunted by humans however in the subtropical so these islands we're talking about like Norfolk, Rowell, uh, Pitcairn and Henderson they're further south and they're kind of at this point the variety and the availability of wild resources drops off compared to their sort of tropical brothers and sisters and um, and also in this region, you're kind of hitting the limits of uh, where reefs are able to develop. So reefs are primarily 
you know, found in tropical regions. I mean, as the further south that we go, the you know availability of um, reefs drops off, and you know fish were actually a really important food source, especially in tropical islands. So these subtropical islands were kind of limited in terms of their wild resources for that initial colonization stage. The next kind of um, factor is kind of living at the limits of adaptability. So moving around that kind of cycle we we're looking at, the next stage is establishment. We're talking about, you know, when wild resources drop off, they shift to the, these crops. And I love this picture. I've, I included quite a few pictures from the kind of the it's like Captain Cook's kind of expeditions. This one was done by Sydney Parkinson. Uh, it's a painting of Tahiti. And when talking about the sort of establishment about crops, they brought, you know, they didn't come empty handed, they brought crops, they knew what they needed to do to be able to live in these islands. And in this picture, we kind of see in the bottom left corner, we've got the, you know, these kind of almost love heart shaped leaves. This is taro. This is a really important staple crop and taro is actually a really thirsty crop. So the Pacific is generally quite a wet region. So it's really well suited for this kind of environment. And also to the right here, we've got the you know the tree that's kind of sort of sticking out of the ground there. That's a breadfruit tree, and breadfruit is also a really important crop because unlike taro, which is a really thirsty crop, breadfruit is actually uh, really sort of drought resistant. So even in, when times are difficult, you know David was talking about this really variable climate. Breadfruit trees they're able to survive in those kind of situations, and also over time people developed sort of these underground storage pits, and they created pastes out of the breadfruit. That they were able to, you know, they actually last a really long periods of time. It's, it stores really well, and they're able to utilize this resource during times of drought. However, you know, in the subtropical um, region, they're kind of hitting the limits of, you know, where these these crops that they, you know, they've kind of passed down this community knowledge through time. We see these crops appearing all across the Pacific. They're bringing them with them and introducing them to the islands. But as they're moving further south into these subtropical islands, like Raoul and uh, Norfolk, Henderson and Pitcairn, you're hitting the limits of where these crops are able to grow as well. So, you know, breadfruit trees, for example, aren't found in the subtropical region. So they're kind of limiting their ability to adapt to these kind of really variable climate. Um, uh, yeah. And it passed down the, so yeah, they passed down the knowledge and hitting the limits. So yeah, I would say actually, it's not just hitting the ecological limits, but also uh, of, of where we to grow, but also the knowledge limits. So they're able to adapt to a tropical environment, but the subtropical, that you know, they're hitting the limits of what they know and how they, their ability to adapt to these kind of situations. The final one I'm going to go um, sort of consider is inter-island links. So, you know, as I said previously, most islands have been discovered by you know 1300 AD, and we know that they traded between them. They were in these inter-island links. We know this because we find artifacts in islands that we know can't have come from there. They must have come from somewhere else. We know there's these these uh, sort of trade links between them. Um, you know, the, people arrived by 1300, but by 1500 AD, just about 200 years later, um, these kind of connections we know started to drop off, and people, you know, islands became more isolated. And in the Pacific, as you move further east and further south, the kind of space between islands increases. And so the islands uh, in the subtropics are actually really isolated and they're likely to be probably some of the first islands to drop off this inter-island network. And because, you know, the, the poor physical resources that we talked about before in terms of the wild resources and their ability to grow crops, it's likely that the communities on these islands really struggled and they either decided to, you know, uh, you know abandon uh, their settlements move elsewhere if possible because you know as David said at some point all the islands are colonized and you can't necessarily use that as an adaptation strategy or they potentially died out so in summary you know whilst Pacific Islanders were really successful there's kind of limits to you know where they were able to colonize the tropics were almost like Goldilocks zone that they were highly adapted to be able to colonize and spread throughout um, all these islands and, but yeah, the subtropics are kind of hitting the limits of not only the ecological in terms of what they're able, you know, what's available in the wild, and also in terms of what they're able to grow in crops. And uh, yeah, potentially uh, they've had to move on or either die out. I'm not entirely sure if these ones still still mystery islands. Um, yeah. So I've kind of, I've, you know, I've, I've given this talk. It's mostly you know, pretty much about history. It fits in with kind of what David thought. We're giving you another piece of the picture of sort of Pacific island history. But you know, this is kind of science. You know, where's the science? You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, you know, all about this history of migration. But what I would say is, um, you know, thanks to science, this, you know, this knowledge is built on archaeology. But then it's kind of built upon by science after that. This foundation of archaeology 
with a kind of science topping on top. Everything that I've kind of told you today is actually um, thanks to science that I've been able to tell you. So, you know, we look at stable isotope data from bones to tell you the diet of people who lived thousands and thousands of years ago. We know, you know, I talked about trade routes and we know that because we find these stone tools around different islands in the Pacific and we're able to use the chemistry of the rocks to say, you know, this has come from Hawaii, this has come from French Polynesia. And like David, uh, and I use lake sediments um, to reconstruct past climate and uh, data from these lake archives can also tell us, you know, when people arrived in the islands, how they impacted the environment around them, you know, what kind of plants did they bring with them? Did they clear the indigenous forests to be able to, you know, grow their crops? You know, so what I'd say is, yeah, I've given you sort of a history talk, but it's actually all founded in science. And science stretches beyond the traditional subjects that you'd expect and reaches into many different areas, including history. Uh, but yeah, I'll wrap up there. I'm hoping that was that right. So thank you for listening. I uh, hope you found it semi interesting and uh, look forward to your questions later on. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for an excellent talk. That was really good. Um, I can see uh, questions are rolling in on the YouTube comments and keep your tweets coming in with that pint of science and hashtag pint21. Uh, and we will be getting two questions in the Q&A later, which promises to be an excellent time. Um, but for now, we're going to say goodbye to Charlotte and thank you again uh, very much. And we're going to be moving on to the Right Reverend Willie Puaseho, who is going to be talking to us about climate change and its effect in the Solomon Islands. Um, and uh, please take it away, Willie. Thank you and greetings, uh, everyone. Uh, it, um, Solomon Islands. We were discovered by a Spanish explorer in 1568 uh, when they, uh, they found the first white people to arrive there. Um, the next was the, the Christian church arrived there in, uh, in 1840s. And so climate change in the Solomons is very dear and close to my heart. And uh, I'll be talking about two villages who were who are directly affected at the moment but not only that but there is a lot of people on other islands also affected in the islands it's not a new topic this uh, climate change uh, because uh, uh, it has uh, um, it was uh, a forum uh, created on the um, environmental uh, global warming in 1972, uh, when United Nations created an environmental program, UNEPD, uh, as the environmental conscience of the United Nations system uh, to create awareness in the other and other agencies uh, of the env environment impact and the activities in the world. And so uh, they have created a small budget to make the awareness, but uh, it, um, it it didn't last uh, since, you know, uh, it didn't affect the big nations. Uh, UNPD, UNEP advocates environmental sound, sustainable development, but in order for that to, to have any meaningful solution and create an impact, we can rely on smaller nations like us in the South Pacific with no resources. It requires the cooperation of our wealthy, powerful nations to join with us and to join forces to achieve a meaningful, sustainable development that is environmentally friendly. UNEP, since it started 1972, and now more than four decades later, in spite of several uh, conventions and forums, there seem to be a lot of discussions and talking, but we don't we need things to be done. It's time now we act. Too much talking is a waste of time as far as we are concerned in the Pacific, because the island nations, are losing the environment, uh, they losing their livelihood. Everything that they have is now wasting or going to the waves. In 2002, 
I took a, uh, a BBC Blue Peter program. We went to the part where I come from, uh, the southeastern part of the Solomons, where you can see now on the uh, picture there, on the left, on the top there, you see the village we filmed in 2002. And in 2016, you see on the right side here, right hand side, is 2016. And by 2019, there's nothing. It's gone. You can only see the waves. You can only see the sea, the ocean. It's all gone. And so from 2002 until 2019, when Murray was there, we only see the waves and the sea. Okay, so that's how how quickly this climate change has moved. And Walande, a thriving village, more than a thousand people who used to live in the sea there within their artificial island is all gone. Now they have to move the mainland. You see the pictures here now is their new settlement. They this land. They only by the goodwill of the mainland people uh, that they have given them permission to live there. They do not own it by right. But the thing is that you see, these people, they are saltwater people, they lose their livelihood, they lose their culture and uh, all the tradition. They have to adapt. They are not used to living on the mainland, they are only used to living in the sea. So the culture of being saltwater people have gone. They have to learn and adapt to new way of life as they settle on the mainland. And so that is what is happening at Walande. The next village I'm going to talk about is Fanale. Here is another village from Port Adam. Uh, this area I know very well because I grew up here. Uh, all these uh, coastal villages here and uh, the area there I know very well. Uh, when I was young, uh, 70 years ago, this village was a thriving village. You know, uh, there were taro, uh, root crops could be grown there. Uh, all the edible trees could be found there on, the, on that island at Fanale. But now in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2002, uh, 2000, uh, you can see picture 2011 to 1990 over there on the left hand side and on the right hand side down bottom there 2011 you see the church we used to have services in is now covered by the sea and you see on top there as well and so this village is now also taken by the waves and by the year 2020 last year on the right hand side, that's the cement wall there or the wall of the old church house, and it's now the sea. So the sea has taken about more than 200 yards, you know, the sea has eaten, you know, into the island here. during. So that's what you see now. And you can see from now here, when the high tide is up, at Fanale, the, the people have to use canoes now. To live to to move around in in the village because the 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 sea has risen and has taken away you know most of the land and so here is a, a family fetching water from a tank water here and they have used a canoe uh, from the land okay so this is what you're seeing now uh, Fanale village and the climate change has taken. Uh, uh, this uh, the toll on these villages. You see, now they have a little church built uh, where we see uh, they are worshiping. But mostly, these pictures here you can see exactly from 2000 and um, uh, last yeah last yes this year. This is up to date now, 2021. A cousin of ours sent the pictures uh, to for me to see here uh, of this um, change here. So uh, that's what I want to share with you today. And so the livelihood of the people of these two villages have gone. They have to settle the mainland. Uh, they have to leave their, their main their islands, their cultures, and uh, their way of life 
is now lost. And so that's what I want to share with you uh, today. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Willie. Those are incredibly powerful photographs. Um, yeah, I'm kind of taken aback. Um, I'm going to invite um, Charlotte and David back onto the screen. And we're going to take some of the questions that have popped up in the audience comments and um, uh, I'll be posing them to the speakers. If you have questions for the speakers, please do write in the YouTube comments and I will um, pose them. Um, so our first question is from Sarah and she has a question for David. Um, and she's wondering what evidence is there for the arrival of, of people in these islands? Like what are the evidence pieces like? Okay, great question, Sarah. Thanks, thanks very much. So, um, two two sorts of evidence, um, really. One is the uh, archaeological evidence. Um, so there are uh, remains of the sorts of structures that uh, Willie was uh, showing. Um, you can find those. You can find um, bits of pottery from early on. Um, but actually, one of the problems with archaeology is, is is that it's it's quite difficult to find the evidence for the very first arrivals where there may have been relatively few people initially. And so they haven't made a large impact, if you like, on the landscape. And that's where, um, and I would say this, lakes come in because actually the burning that they would have done um, to cook food and to clear the land, um, uh, the um, uh, impacts of the soil erosion is washed into those lakes. So we can actually uh, see the arrival of people um, through the, if you like, the proxies for their presence. Uh, my favourite one, however, is the, um, the molecular fossils produced when we poo. Um, because if you work in a tarot swamp and you're caught short, and tarot swamps quite often near lakes, um, actually the uh, stuff from your gut gets transferred eventually into the lake sediment. So we've actually detected the genuine presence of pigs and people. Um, on on the uh, islands from from the remains of their their poo in the uh, in the lake sediments, it's a romantic job. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much, David. That is fascinating. Um, we have a question uh, from the Torgy Toaster for Charlotte. Um, how far apart were the islands that traded? Were they weeks or months travel apart? And and kind of like, what's the longest you know of? Uh, I think the longest is probably because I was reading a uh, paper recently was I think it was looking at sites in Vanuatu which is that's just kind of just off the Solomon Islands in our map um, and there was evidence of I think tools that were from Hawaii because I think there's there's the sort of tools that we're using primarily they use kind of volcanic rocks which a lot of islands are um, but they kind of there's sort of certain sites that you see them crop up again and again so some is Samoa which is you know just kind of maybe bit further over but Hawaii is literally I think thousands of kilometers um it's really remote it's across you know across the equator setting long distances so maybe David can give a better idea on time I think but in terms of distance uh you know potentially thousands of kilometers uh these trade routes I mean maybe you kind of have uh joints so maybe someone traded with someone from French Polynesia and then they traded with someone from Samoa and it's made its way across but it has traveled long distances definitely cool thank you um I don't know if, oh, no, uh, we've got another question uh, from Roshanna, and this one's for Willie. Um, obviously, climate change is a long process that can't be solved on short timescales, but the villages you were showing photographs of, like, they, they appear to need help kind of sooner rather than later. So are there any effort, like, how can efforts be made to kind of reconstruct or to help those villages on shorter timescales? Um, are there any efforts to do that, and how can people help? Yes, I think the um, the Wallande village uh, they've been re relocated on the mainland, uh, but but at the same time, uh, I think we need to help uh, build um, walls to uh, to stop the erosion from the uh, from that coast as well, because the sea is eating into the land as well. So you need to build barriers. To protect that village as well. Finally, also they have moved the mainland uh, today. They, the coastal at the same time, they need to build 
also uh, was to stop the erosion of, of the land because the sea is eating up the mangroves which they used to, to hold the land. And so in, instead of retaining, retaining the land, we need to build. And maybe another thing is to plant mangroves, a program replanting or mangroves to protect the coast uh, as well so that you can retain you know, the land from the erosion. Because erosion is the biggest thing at the moment, eating away the waves and the sea, eating into the land as they have done with these islands. They have taken them in the last, you know, since 2002. And now they're gone, you know, and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's uh, this. Those are important uh, actions to be taken. And also, I think the relocation uh, is a big thing. It's expensive to purchase land elsewhere for resettlement of the people uh, in the islands. Our Polynesian islands like Ong Tong Java, uh, who are outlying atolls of the Solomons uh, in the northern part, uh, they, they, they have lost most of the islands. And uh, people, you know, they, they are just sitting like, you know, on, on the float tank, really, you know. It's very difficult. They have to, we have to find land for them to resettle them. The resettlement is the biggest uh, program that we need to undertake and to relocate them on the mainland. But then, you know, as you said, you know, uh, David, the, uh, the other people have settled there already as well. And so yeah. when you go, there's this migration and resettlement is a big problem, you know, big challenge as well, you know. Uh, people will be displaced, you know. They, they, the other people are, will be, they will be rejected as well, you know. Mm. They will be saying, you know, we don't want you here, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a migration and, and mm. resettlement is a big program, pro, you know, problem as well. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Mm. Um, we have a question from Bella Lenzel, um, which is, did ocean currents have influences on these things? And I think, David, you mentioned El Nino. So do you want to go into a little bit more detail on, on how that kind of thing influences these um, processes? Sure. And again, um, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty spot on question there. The, um, the ocean currents are, are driven in part by um, uh, remote processes that drive sort of ocean swell um but also of course by wind um and it and they're influenced as well by the distribution of the islands because you know although they're nice they're small islands at the top they are only the top of very large sea mounts or mountain uh, uh, ranges and um what's interesting is of course that influences the pattern of currents now the polynesian voyagers um were, were brilliant at interpreting the changing currents and knowing where they were in the in, in the ocean from not only the stars, but also the currents uh, and the wave uh, refraction, if you like, round islands. So there are a whole bunch of things that enable them to navigate. Going straight to the point uh, about could currents influence which islands were co commonly recolonized or colonized? Yes, some some absolutely uh, could have been reached by just drift voyaging. Uh, problem is, is drift voyaging tends to take a lot longer than, um, well, it does take a lot longer than wind-driven sailing. And, and, and the big problem that links back to, I think, the question that Charlotte was answering about how long does it take is that actually you can run out of food um, and you can run out of fresh water. And so, it, you know, there are critical thresholds where a group of people on a canoe big enough to settle an island so we're not talking about two people here we're talking about you know, it varies but between sort of uh, 40 and 80 people needed for a viable population um you know you've got to feed and water those people and get them from a to b so yeah sure currents have a, a role to play but um really the the, the successful colonizations would have been with wind driven um uh, canoes that would have shortened the journey time and allowed those people to survive Cool, thank you very much indeed. 
Uh, and we have another question uh, for David from Manar. Um, what led to the decline of Easter Island and was climate a factor in that? Uh, well, uh, uh, Charlotte, Charlotte could probably answer this in terms of the, 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 the sort of process. And maybe you want to come in. But um, to get straight to the point about was climate a factor? Absolutely, it was a factor. Um, and, and really exciting new stuff is coming out of Easter Island um, that, that is beginning to show very clear evidence for, again, large drought periods. Um, drought periods are uh, both around the time of the, the colonization. Uh, so that kind of supports the work we've done further west. So that's good news. Um, but then later on uh, in the sort of 16th century, uh, there's evidence for a big period of drought there, which, which demarcates the end of the sort of monument building phase, you know, the big heads in Easter Island and the transition to what's called the Birdman cult. Um, and there's a sense there that the combined process of uh, the sort of removal of the vegetation by both people and their commensurate rats that came with the canoes and, uh, and a whole range of other reasons actually corresponded with a drought. And that may have tipped the population into uh, changing their sort of culture in response to it. Big argument now okay. about whether it's uh, what did it collapse or actually were they, you know, still there and doing doing sort of reasonably well until the Europeans arrived and brought diseases. Charlotte, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I suppose the anecdote maybe I'd like to add is because I've kind of read some of the, you know, Captain Cook's um, sort of, I would say, journals of the, of the voyages, because, you know, the Europeans, a lot of Pacific history is oral history. It's passed down through the generations. So some of the first Britain histories of the Pacific are done by the Europeans that first arrived. And I remember that there's a, there's a part in Cook's where he arrived, I think, in the third voyage on Easter Island. And when he got there, they said the water that he traded with the islanders for was so poor and so salty that it wasn't even worth bringing on board. And the food on the island, there just didn't seem to be very much of anything that they could trade with them. And in fact, he left Easter Island because he just thought the resources were so terrible and decided to set sail for Tahiti where he knew he was going to get fresh water and food. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think climate probably did have a, a part to play. And also, you know, David talks about kind of the changes in, you know, cutting down native forests, things like that. You know, there's all these different factors played together uh, to, you know, what, what happened on Easter Island, basically. But, yeah, I really find it interesting, the little sort of observations from people at the time as well. Yeah, I know that. Uh, I think that adds a lot of context. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Bella um, who asks, what causes the severe land disappearance that we were seeing in Willie's photos? Is that erosion or is it rising sea levels or is it a combination of the two? It is both, yeah. Sea er erosion uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, sea level, sea rise as well. You know, it um, goes into the water where the people use on the islands and uh, is solenated uh, the loss of their crops as well. The sea, it is poison everything, you know? And so we used to like on Funnelly, when I was young, we used to get fresh water from the well there. We can cook, we can wash, we can even drink from the well. Uh, but, you know, 70 years later, it's now all gone, you know? But when I was growing up, the island it we have all the different crops on the mainland are there as well you can grow everything you know from the island so it's a rise of sea level and the land erosion where the, the sea is also contributing to that as well excellent thank you thank you very much indeed and i think we have uh, a question that's just come in um from Liviu l uh, and this is a question for all the speakers. Um, the oceans are powerful equalizers and they carry no borders. Do you think we understand the potential long-term impact of renewable energy? Um, so, uh, David, if you if you go first, and then I'll turn to uh, Charlotte and Willie after that. What's your take on, on this? I've absolutely no answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, I can't even begin to think about the scale of 
scale of renewable energy we would need in order to change El Nino's? Is that is that the context of that question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I must admit, my I'm I'm a lowly uh, space physicist, so well, you're expertise... probably the better one to answer it. <laughs> no, no, no. My the, the currents I study are electric currents rather than <laughs> ocean currents, unfortunately. But it's it's my understanding that it it it's kind of you're you're talking on different scales almost. Um, I don't know if that's the opinion of the panel. Yeah, uh, my, my, my gut reaction would be we're not taking anything like the quantity of energy out of the uh, ocean atmosphere system that, that exists there. Okay. I, th I think, I think you know, we need the, you know, the big countries, the wealthy nations. I think we, we must think, you know, about how can we how can we save our whole planet you know it's something that we could do some acting now drastically so that in the whole planet is 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 suffering you know it's already suffering the ocean is already suffering the atmosphere is suffering everything is suffering at the moment you know mm -hmm. so unless we take drastic measures to protect and um, our nation and our our nations, our planet Earth, and the atmosphere, the oceans, you know, we are really choking the whole, everything, you know, because the oceans are connected, the currents are connected, everything is connected, the atmosphere is connected. Nobody lives independently of, of you know, of, of the other. We are all interrelated, all our nations, all our climate, the atmosphere, the oceans, you know, all all that together. So you know what is we, what we throw in the sea here, it it goes there. What we put in the air here, it affects there. So that that's you know we are all contributing to all this. You know, I blame everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that is and that's a great place to be actually if if we're all to blame we all yeah. have to step up and, and and be part of the solution willie i think that's really well said yeah, yeah no here 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 i think that was magnificently put thank yeah. you okay. um charlotte did you have anything you wanted to add or i don't think i have anything to follow on from willie's honestly that is all. fair that is fair um <laughs> So yeah, I think um, I think we all probably feel very strongly that we've all got to pitch in and do our bit for the environment and um, and, and yeah, uh, I think um, the, you know it's really good to have that discussion and, and see that beginning to take off. Um, and thank you all very much for kind of giving talks that touch on that um, from a kind of unique perspective. It was really interesting. Um, I think that is all the time we have for questions. So thank you again very much um, to the speakers. Um, and uh, please keep tweeting. I believe you can keep commenting on YouTube if you'd like. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, uh, send us a tweet, hashtag Pint21, and at Pint of Science, let us know that you're watching it on replay. And um, I think we have a word cloud which sums up some of the stuff that was being talked up in the chat. Um, so island, migration, climate change, volcanic, sorry, a mirrored, so volcanic. Um, but yes, thank you all very much for attending. Um, there are more Point of Science events happening tomorrow, um, but not from the University of Southampton. Um, University of Southampton will be coming back on Thursday evening with the Inquisitive Person's Guide to the Galaxy. And I will be hosting again then, so I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you very much for coming and uh, have a good evening.